and welcome to the Marginally Geeky Show. I'm your host for the evening, Eugene Stevens. Tonight, I'm joined by my Canadian brothers, Chris and – no, not Chris. Ray. <laughs> Ray and John. I looked the wrong thing. Uh, <laughs> I've got Ray and John here. Boy, she's going to give me hell about that. Uh, <laughs> she will, and I'll make sure she knows about it. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you will. <laughs> uh, she's not joining us again tonight, uh, even though I – she did have – more positive view on this book, right? This book was more positive view on it. Um, but the, the overall, the series, she's like, eh, it's fine the first listen. I can't listen to it again. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. So even I'm, – I'm in Sean's camp, though. I, I Every so often, it's like, nope, time to go check out yeah. Ishmael and just go through them again. But um, So we're obviously uh, doing the next book in the series. Uh, we are almost done with the primary series, which is two trilogies, and we are on book – Five called Captain Share. Um, I guess let's just go ahead and jump in. Uh, Ray, initial thoughts? Uh, I feel th this is my second favorite of the book, of the series. Okay. Um, of this, sorry, of the two trilogies. Okay. Um, this one, I am I feel like it, it hits its stride again. I, I agree. I, what's your favorite? Still the first one? First one's my favorite. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Anyway, dogs in there having fun. Uh, Sean, uh, initial thoughts. Um, I'm. I think I'm with Ray on this one. Like the first one is hands down always going to be my favorite, but this one, it, it's not as dark. It's really intelligent. Mm -hmm. um, the characters are like there isn't a one-dimensional character in this one. All of them bring something to the table, and it's just it's really really well written. It's one of those ones like. I put it on and I, oh, I'm done like a day and a half later because I just couldn't stop listening to it. So. Yeah. Um, I am probably in the same camp. This is probably my second favorite one. Um, I, I mentioned in the previous book, and there's a lot of darkness in the previous book, but you see, you see what kind of a man Ishmael is. In this book, we get to see him become that man. He fully becomes the man he's he's going to be, and you can see it in everything he does, the way he becomes a captain, uh, the way he handles the ship that he gets. Um, it's just, you know, it was a little nerve wracking at the beginning of the book because, or not so much at the beginning, when, once he gets his own ship, it's like, okay, are we about to go through another, um, <laughs> uh, what was the previous one? Uh, double share. Are we about to go through another one of those? And, uh, no, we, it's, it's, it is a lot lighter, like you said, Sean. So, uh, let's go ahead and get into the book. Uh, so once again, we are picking up, it is several years, once again, unlike the first yeah. trilogy, which is back to back to back, it's several years ahead again. Um, at the end of the last book, uh, we got rid of the horrible captain and the horrible first mate. Um, people stepped in, we have a new captain and she remains uh, there and Ish works his way up and when we pick up he is the first mate of the um, William Tinker so uh, completely different situation it, you know it's actually one of the best ships in the fleet uh, everyone wants to work there a lot many people want to leave and everything um, he's first mate the biggest thing is is he's now married and he's been married for seven years um, sure. We get we don't meet Jen that much. There's not that many scenes with Jen, which is fine because um, <laughs> you meet her in Double her? Share. Like, what you meet her in Double Share? Uh, that's the first bartender that he meets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I actually I, that's probably the one gripe I have about this book. I know why they married him off mm -hmm. to like kind of flesh out his story a little bit, especially back on port and kind of show he's still a little bit of a land rat because they explain it. But really, I probably could have done without the Jen storyline. Not that it was huge or anything like that. But my favorite part is when he finds out what's going on with her. Yeah, I know. With the I shoe and all that. Because <laughs> he doesn't describe, well, he doesn't say the actual thing. He just says that he tries to put on a boot that doesn't fit. Yeah. Well, he does that twice because he also puts on a shirt that didn't fit. Didn't figure that one out either. Yes. That was early on. So, you know, it gives you a timeline. Basically, yeah. Jen is screwing around on him. Yes. That's, um, so and he figures it out. <laughs> we're not going to. And like I said, I'm, I'm 
I noticed the last couple of books, we've kind of fallen back into the, you know, let's just go through it, you know, timeline, <laughs> trying yeah. not to do that, but I'm trying to make sure I get everything listed that happens in these books. Cause there is a lot. Um, so let's talk about that. So yes, he is married. Uh, he's been married for seven years. He's now 38 years old. And, um, people ask him, you know, like, why did you get married? Like, seriously, you, you knew going into this, you are a spacer, like that's your life. And you seem to be happy about it. Why did you marry someone that's on a station? Because you only see her for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, uh, every several months. In some cases, you know, it may be three or four, five months go by before you see her again. Um, and he just, he's like, you know, that was the thing to do. That's how I grew up. You know, you, you know, you grew up, you got married, you had kids. That's how you become an adult. And he's like, that's what I thought I was supposed to do. And it turns out, Luckily, they didn't have kids, no. um, although I could see him being a great father. Uh, but, yeah, he just, you know, it's just not working out. And like you said, there's we start getting hints. Um, it seems like at one point, you know, he says one of the worst parts about going out is is he knows that night before she's going to give him shit. Well, mm -hmm. you're leaving again. And, and he notices all of a sudden things just kind of change. And she's just like, you know. I've come, I've got to think about it. This is your life. This is my life. I can either, you know, I can either be happy or I can keep doing like what I'm doing. And I've decided I'm going to try to make it where I can be happy. And he's like, Oh, okay. Well, things will, maybe cool. things will work out now. <laughs> and she, what she found to make her happy is apparently another dude. So, yeah. uh, the neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> um, the neighbor. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, he's ready to leave. He's just found out he's, a, he's become a captain. Uh, and he's about to head off, and uh, he goes to uh, – she's still in bed. He's letting her sleep in. He goes to put on a boot, and it's not his eyes. And mm -hmm. it just kind of clicks in. Okay, this is what's happened. I have to say, very mature for how he handled it. I, I don't know if I would have that same maturity, but I, on the other hand, the way he describes it, it's like – he, it, it's been going on for several, like almost the entire time he's been married. And he's just like, you know, I, I haven't been fair to her. She hasn't been fair to me. Like this just did not, was not going to ever work. I, I do love that the lawyer asks him, like, how are you going to know that she's going to sign these papers? Deliver it in the boot. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that's, yeah. that's fantastic. <laughs> oh yeah. That, yeah, that was, that was awesome. Um, so that is part of the story is the fact that he, uh, during the middle of this, of, of his first time becoming a captain, um, uh, he's now unattached and at, later on in the book, uh, whenever there's, you know, shore leave, he's just like, I don't know what to do with myself now because, you know, the captain doesn't go hang out with the rest of the crew. And now I, I, I don't know what to do with myself. So. Uh, you know, which leads him to, you know, into to finding some different people to, to, you know, have dinner with or whatever, and uh, leads into some, you know, other people that are on his ship. So, because, you know, we don't screw with crew, but still. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, Freddie is the captain, and um, she even asked him, why did you get married or whatever? So um, they're coming back, and um, the Chernikova, they, they get a distress signal from the ship, the Chernikova. And uh, or they get they get noticed that this this ship is derelict out in space, and you know they're like, well, what are we going to do? And they're like, well, we could, we could try to lay you know a, a salvage claim on this. It's going to put us back several weeks, but uh, if it pans out, like this could be worth a, a ton of money for you know the entire crew and everything. So uh, they end up deciding we're going to go over to the ship. He goes over there, goes to essentially knock on the door or whatever. Um, lights are running. It's got power. It just, but obviously everyone is dead. So um, when they go over, he's actually been put in charge to you know, lead the expedition. They go in, everyone's dead. Uh, turns out they were just kind of on a shoestring budget and they didn't have enough, you know, they let things lapse. They, uh, they didn't keep the computers up to date. They didn't uh, have all the equipment they should have had. And I think it was a carbon monoxide buildup. That, yeah, they had a small fire that was smoldering and they disabled all the sensors yep and uh carbon monoxide builds up and without any of the sensors telling you hey you're you're gonna die you just kind of start feeling lightheaded and the, and you're out the sensors worked the alarm yeah. oh that's right the alarm that's right the sensors worked. the alarms just didn't go off that's <laughs> yeah. right 
the light didn't blink off. And they're like, oh, I guess there was an issue. Yeah. Um, and so, it, you know, they follow all the paperwork, do all this stuff, and he's basically acting captain on this ship uh, so that they can get it back. Um, so they get it back closer to port. Uh, you know, the authorities come out, check over the ship. Make sure, you know, yeah, obviously y'all didn't do anything, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, actually, they actually come out there first, and they're like, well, can y'all get it back? And they're like, yeah, we we can get it back. We'll just have a skeleton crew. And, you know, they talk about having to air out the ship and stuff because of the smell and all of the other good stuff that would go along with this. Uh, you know, they're not really able – they're able to clean minimal stuff to get things going. But they're like, even – even if it wasn't a derelict ship, like it was not in good condition. Like there was dirt, you know, over all the controls and stuff. It was just, it was not a good situation all the way around. Um, and so anyway, they come back, he arrives to port and literally he gets like, as he's getting are about to walk off the ship, uh, she calls him in and was like, Oh, by the way, you're sitting for captain in like 30 minutes. So go take a shower, put on a fresh suit, like get the hell out there. So he goes, he sits for the, uh, um, the uh, uh, captain's position. Uh, I like how, and I wonder if this is, I wonder if this is like this in real life. Every other position, you basically just schedule, take the test, you pass the test, you get the certification. Captain certification though, you have to be invited. And then you have to sit with other captains and they basically kind of, you know, grill you. There's a writing portion, but the rest of the time they grill you over, why did you do this? How would you have done this? And, Questions that you should really be asking someone who's going to take over, in a, you know, an important position like this. Um, so he, he, you know, he thinks he does well or whatever. Um, and uh, um, let's see here. So arrives in port, sits for the captain's test. When he gets home, when they end up leaving port and come home, um, Freddie calls him into the office, you know, into her, her quarters again and basically says, uh, here's your captain's certificate. It was, you, you passed, they accepted you, um, you know, it was already set up. It was going to be here when you got here. Um, also, I'm retiring. And he's just like, okay, this is, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Like, you're retiring and, and everything else. And he's like, they're not going to give me this ship. And he, she's like, no, I asked them to, but they're not going to listen. Um, you know, they've got another captain moving over from uh, the... Um, oh, Agamemnon. The Agamemnon. And he's like, "Ooh, that's not really a good ship." They're like, "Yeah, they're they're gonna give him, they're gonna give the captain this ship, uh, and you can definitely stay on as first mate, but they're gonna make you an offer, and it's gonna be up to you." And of course, he's like, "Why would I not take a captain's position? What are they gonna do? Give me the Agamemnon?" And he's like, "Give me the Agamemnon." <laughs> so he literally has a not a crisis, but he definitely has to think it over. Do I want to stay as first mate on an absolutely stellar ship? Or do I literally want to go to the worst ship in the fleet and try to take that on? Um, and so it was at this point in the book, I was just like, oh, crap. <laughs> it, it's double share again. Like, they're 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 freaking screwing poor Ishmael over again, giving him, like, the worst freaking ship that's out there. So, um, but he kind of hems and haws about it a little bit. And, and they're like, no, you're going to take it. It's funny because the rest of the crew, the entire rest of the crew are just like, well, it's been nice working with you. And he's like, yeah. but I haven't decided yet. And they're like, sure, sure you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's be honest. Like you're offered an opportunity like that. I'm pretty sure you're going to take it. Right. Yeah. I like how the cook had already sent over the co his favorite yeah. coffee and stuff like he, that. Yeah, yeah, I like that mom. too. Yeah. He's like, well, I was asking for the new, you know, the new captain apparently likes tea, so we'll have to set that up or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I went ahead and sent her your coffee over there. He's like, yeah, that was an awful nice thing for you to do, not knowing that I was going to take this. And, of course, once again, it's like, yeah, sure, you weren't going to take it. <laughs> um, You're not going to take it. Well, yeah. then the whole crew had a bet on the actual time, yeah. including oh, God, the new captain. That too. That was can good. you just wait a little bit, like until oh yeah. eight thirty or something like that? Yeah. Can Can you wait to seven thirty? Because yeah. Delman's got seven fifteen. <laughs> and then whenever he goes to knock on Delman's door, literally the answer is Shit. not come. It's damn it. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he he even he is in on yeah. it and and yeah. knows he's lost. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Maloney. We go back. We get we we meet up with uh, Maloney, who who owns the entire business. We we meet Kurt again, 
Um, it's funny because a lot of the things that, you know, the kind of the snarky comments he makes or whatever to, you know, Kurt sitting over in the next booth or whatever is the bodyguard. He's crack, you know, trying not to crack up and laugh or whatever. <laughs> some of the stuff he's throwing out there. Um, but one of the interesting things that he throws out there is he's like, you know, well, here's your pay. I'll do this. They kind of negotiate and he goes, how about I throw in painting your cabin? Um, which kind of becomes a running joke later yeah. on in, in, in the rest of the series. That's kind of the thing. Like when you, when you take on a new position, uh, they paint the cabin for you. So, um, let's see here. Uh, this is when he goes home to Jen. Um, things seem to be okay. And he goes to eat at over easy. And he does that multiple times in the book. We still don't find out what's going on there. We just know that constantly goes to old, uh, to over easy. There's just something about the potatoes, Frank's finest. There's just something about it that just, it reminds him of home. It's just very soothing to him. Um, I thought this was the book where we find out that. No. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, get, <laughs> I guess it's the next one. So. Owner's share. Owner's share. Okay. Um, oh, it is owner's share. It is. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's right. Uh, so at this point he goes home, Jen, um, okay, over easy, uh, meets Kurt Maloney and then he goes aboard the Agamemnon. So they show up, they literally go to knock on the door and no one freaking answers. And they're just like, what the hell is going on? Like, why is, why are they not answering the door? First off, it sounds like a foghorn. So obviously <laughs> someone can hear it. Uh, and then about that time they hear a foghorn coming up behind them <laughs> and it's the first mate. Um, so a couple of quick things before we get into this. So he already knows that the ship has, um, it's well known for certain things. Uh, the the crew is full of troublemakers. The first mate is a little bitch <laughs> and is like super loud and is just constantly on everyone or whatever. And like, it makes no freaking money. It's just, it's just a horrible it's a horrible place the, to work. The, the crew also has their own lawyer, essentially, and he knows yeah. the rules inside and out. Right, exactly, yes. <laughs> uh, so anyway, she comes on. Um, Thomas is her last name. She comes on. They open the door, and uh, I don't remember which one of the crew made it is. We were talking about this before the show. I didn't write, write down the, the quote, three troublemakers' names. Uh, but he's literally, like, sp- splayed out on uh, over the desk like he's asleep or whatever. And um, he's trying to handle it in in his own way, but then Thomas just jumps in and like just jumps the guy's ass and or whatever. Um, he says not to. Like she, he shakes. Yes. He's like, no, don't do it, and she does it. And lays right into him. Yeah. Um, and so that's where we have our we have our first kind of real meeting or whatever. So uh, he ends up calling her up to you know uh, his quarters, and he's like, you know, shut the door, and she's like, I don't think that. That's not proper. We shouldn't be doing that. And he's like, are you planning on taking advantage of me? What What's going on here? What's wrong? And she's just kind of freaking out. And, like, he really has to kind of jump her ass. And he's like, you know, you are the first mate. You are going to stand here at attention, and you're not going to say another damn word until I tell you to say something. Do you understand that? And, it, you know, she kind of gets it a little bit. He's like, listen, I don't want to talk about this out in public. That's why the door is shut. Nothing is going to happen here. I don't screw with crew. Uses the quote exactly. And it's just like, listen, you know, I told you not to not to, you know, ring him out and you did it anyway. Why did you do that? Well, it needed to be done. Well, what was the what was the outcome? Well, he needed to be taught a lesson. Well, what was the lesson? Like, he's he's very quickly kind of saying, yeah. this doesn't make sense. Like, why are why are why are some of these things happening the way they are? Um, he did also and tell the guy initially. He kind of leaned over and he's like, you know, the next time you do this, it's uh, you know, you're gonna find yourself in some real trouble. Yeah. Um, uh, quite a few of the crew he has to go over, uh, properly uh, talking to him. He's just like, you know, while I'm on the ship, it's you know, uh, uh, oh, sir, uh, captain. Sir. Sar. Sar, sar, yes. It's Sar. Or yes, Sar. Or yes, Captain. Or yes, Captain Sar. But not yeah or anything else. Yeah. Um, and so we meet the first mate. She's a heavy worlder, uh, which means she has a, a, an extremely incredible uh, uh, metabolism. metabolism and has to like eat a, quite a bit of food to, you know, to keep going. Uh, she also has a super duper loud voice. And like, even when she's trying to talk at normal conversational levels, it's still like a foghorn. So when she's yelling at someone, it's like deafening. Um, 
And then we meet the cook, <laughs> Mr. Wyatt. Um, but he's the cargo. <laughs> yeah. He's the cargo master. He's not actually the cook. He's yeah. the cargo handler. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and and so like his first his first meal is literally like hmm. old cold cuts and like cheese and Chew. just like sliced bread or whatever and just and he's like is this is this the normal meal and he's like oh no 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 sometimes I open a can of soup. <laughs> so, when we're on the go, it's two cans of soup. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah, it's two cans. Yeah, because there's more people here. Um, and so yeah, he's the cook. He's the cargo handler. He's in charge of stores or whatever. And and over just the first couple of days while they're in they're in port, he starts figuring out some stuff. Like one of the first things he's like, he's like, well, do we have a do we have a uh, cargo yet? You know, to kind of let us know when we're, when we need to head out. And he's like, oh no, I haven't called down for cargo handling yet. And he's like, you haven't called who? <laughs> so he's like, I need to go check something. I will be right back. And literally leaves the ship, goes down to the central office, and is just like, I need to talk to cargo dispatch. And they're like, who? Wh- that's not a thing. What are you talking about, Captain? And he's like, well, I have a guy. And he calls, and they're like, oh, Mr. Wyatt. Yeah, Mr. Wyatt's not quite all right in the head. So we just pick the first three things that are all going in the same place and give it to him. And he's just like, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. So he goes back to the ship and it's just like, I've got to, so he's already walks on the ship and he's like, I've got to teach this guy how to, how to pick car. That he even can pick cargo. Like literally the first four books leading up to this point. Well, except for the last one. I don't think he really, he didn't do cargo stuff in the last one. But the first three books is literally how he became the person he is by picking cargo. Um, so, you know, he's kind of like, we're like, all right, cool. We're getting back into this rut. This is this is good. This is kind of old school. We're going to maybe see him use some of his old magic to, you know, pick some decent cargos for this place. Um, but he lays out an interesting uh, challenge to him. And he's like, all right, here's what I want you to do for the next, I don't know, what was it, two weeks, four weeks? Two weeks two weeks, something like that. I want you to come up with a menu using the food that we have for the next two weeks, three meals a day, plus, you know, this or that and the other, and you can't repeat the same meal and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, when do you need it by? He's like, well, when can you get it by? He's like, well, a couple hours. And he's just like, oh, like, are you sure? Because even I couldn't do that. And you're supposed to be a little soft in the head. And sure enough, he does it. So it, it already kind of triggers him. He's like, okay, there's more to this guy than meets the eye. Like something's something's not right here. Like, you know, the first mate is super loud and just jumps on everyone. The cargo guy is apparently not a moron. He he just doesn't know how to do or what to do on his job. Um, then we meet Gretchen Gearhart, our our um, chief engineer, and she knows her stuff. Her part of the ship is the only part that is spick and span and looks and runs exactly the way it should. And she talks and laughs like a little girl. And it's kind of off putting to most people. That, um, that's what I found a big difference between when Nathan Lowell narrated the original audiobook series and mm-hmm. this one. I think Nathan Lowell did a much better job of Greta. Really? Um, he had something to the voice when she was childlike mm-hmm. and there was, it was almost two distinct personalities like there is in this one, but Nathan was so much better at doing the two personalities of the same person. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of the few things that really stands out between the differences in the audiobooks. That's cool. Yeah. Um, like I said, we've already met. We've already met our three troublemakers. Uh, we've met at least one of them. Uh, one of them, like like you said, is kind of the lawyer of the group or whatever. And he's yeah. like, "Well, you can't, you can't just fire us or you know bust us down for no, you know, no reason or whatever." But you know, Ishmael knows his law, so he's like, "Well, if you can, you know, I, I can't remember. Oh, that's what it was. So he um, he makes one of the morale officer. Yeah, this is the lowest they ranking get, one. But they they get. Uh, he has to go bail them out. He gets called. You know, he's in the middle of everything. He's trying to get stuff set up. He's trying to figure out cargo. He's trying to figure out this. And then literally, he gets a call. He's like, uh, "We've got, we've got several of your cat, your crew members uh, in the brig. We need you to come pick them up." And he's just like, All "Right, we leave the ship again and go do this. <laughs> we go do this." And he bails them out and bails them out with 
his money and and tells them this. He's like, you know, you're going to repay me out of your shares. Um, number one, uh, and number two, this didn't come out of the ship because that would punish everyone else. Yeah. You owe me. Yeah. And they're like, well, you know, good luck getting the money back because you know the way that we make money on this ship, you'll you'll never see it. And he's like, no, that's one of the things that's changing. I'm here to make money. I'm not here to do this. I'm not. I'm here. I, you know, I want it to work efficiently, but I am here to make money. And at that point, you can see it already starts to click with these guys. Okay, maybe I can work with this guy because <laughs> yeah, their well, shares have been garbage. Why? Why put forth effort if you're not making any money? And it's around that time that he makes the deal with one of the one of them to say, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to pick or if if White's picking cargo, like it's never going to happen. And so he makes the the bet. Yes. And, you want to explain the bet? Yeah. So the bet was um, it was a Mr. Hill. I think it's Hill. I think it was Hill. Yeah, so Hill said that he was going to outpick Wyatt for cans. So there's three cans. Um, so each person gets a can. Now uh, the captain gets another can as well. So he gets. So the deal is that cap, the captain's going to pick one, the first can, and then the other two guys have got to jump on a can that's going to go in the same location. And if Mr. Hill wins, they get a hot tub. <laughs> and uh, if if uh, Ishmael wins. Then uh, if Hill, Avery wins, or sorry, yeah, if Why, Avery, yeah. then uh, Hill's got to be an apprentice to to Avery for for like six months or something like that. Yeah, I don't That's remember the cool. timeline, but yeah, yeah. So he had to he had to for the rest of the time that he's on the ship, he's like, you're not gonna make a stipulation as to how long that is. He's like, no. <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you get out of this? He's like, <laughs> we make money. Like, uh, you know, I'm gonna pick a can, so we're definitely going to make some money. And y'all are both going to pick cans, and that's going to make money. So we still make money. Like I don't, I don't lose here. Yeah. So, um, which you know, I I love that. I love that type of thinking of well, then let's do something kind of out of the box yeah. that is going to sol- not only solve you know be a solution, but it's a creative solution that benefits everyone you know all the way around. Um, it's at this point that he goes and it goes back to Mister Wyatt and is like, you know, here's how you. Like you get to pick, like you don't, you don't have to call someone you can pick. And he's like, okay, well, you know, I guess when we get in port, I'll pick something. He's like, no, no, <laughs> you can pick before we even get there. And they're like, well, how do you do that? So he's explaining all this stuff and he, he, he goes to Gerhardt. He's like, do you have a monitor or something that we can put up so that it's large and we can see, you know, while we're doing other stuff. And she's like, sure, I've got something. So she installs it and does it very quickly and efficiently. So once again, we're cemented with the idea that she knows her shit. If everyone else on this ship, she knows what she's doing. It's just, why? what's with the little girl boys? Yeah. Um, it's also at this point that we get into yet another old school uh, um, Ishmaelism, and that is the food's not very good, the coffee sucks. Well, first things first, that's what you yeah. always fix first. You fix the coffee, you fix the food, you're going to fix everything else. Yeah. Um, so a lot of this time he spends cooking and stuff, and he starts, you know, having these conversations with Mr. Wyatt, and he's like, you know, I, number one, you did something I don't think even I could do, come up with a menu that quickly. Um, but, you know, you you seem like, oh, that's what it was. Mr. Wyatt baked something, and it's fantastic. And he's like, you're an excellent baker. Like, you can... It, it seems like you can follow the instructions. You just can't uh, come up with stuff on your own. You can't you can't do jazz essentially for cooking. And he starts helping him with this. He's like, well, let's go. We're gonna go buy some stuff. We're gonna go buy some stuff and give you know start with this. And it doesn't take very long that Mr. Wyatt starts you know doing stuff, and the rest of the crew starts noticing it very quickly. They're just like, the ship smells fantastic. Yeah. What the hell is that? Who's here? <laughs> so because it's not Mr. Wyatt, that's not what we're used to. Um. And then we get to the second mate, Mr. Ryan. Yeah. Uh, uh, Buck, uh, was it, what did they call him? That's Buc- Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul. I'm sorry, Mr. Paul. Uh, yeah. Um, not Buckaroo. Buc- uh, Buccaneer. Buccaneer Billy. Buccaneer Billy. Um, yeah, he's the second mate. He seems to know how to do his job fairly well, but everything is pirates. Uh, the ship, you know, jumps long or short pirates, something burns in the kitchen pirates. That's, that's actually one of my favorite, uh, parts between Ishmael and, and him is as, as Ishmael's cooking, 
and uh, and he walks in and he's like, "What are we? What are you doing? I'm, I'm making pirate repellent." <laughs> yeah. Do you see any pirates? He's, what? Oh, it must be working. How many pancakes do you want? <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, um, so that was oh that was one of the other that was one of the other big things before things start to kind of to gel together. Things are just kind of started getting going. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, jump long, reach the side against the scary path. Okay. Um, so what, before they, before they get off, um, they're, um, a, he, he's off ship. This is when he's dealing with the stuff with his wife. He comes back the next morning. There's smoke. The ship smells. He's like, uh, it smells like burnt bacon. He yeah. walks in. Thomas is like bringing people out. There's, you know, people are, there's one guy down on the ground, like trying to get bacon grease off the ground or whatever. There's another guy standing over there, like with his hands or whatever. She's yelling at the top of her lungs. And like, the first thing he does is basically tell her to shut her trap. He drops the bag and a clunk. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And he's like, he's like, you know, one of them had the, the, at least knew enough to go captain on deck. Yeah. And then proceeds two of the guys, I need you to immediately stop what you're doing and go to med medical bay and deal sure. with your hands and everything else. So they go take care of that. He calls her back up to his office, tells her to shut the door again. Once again, you know, just kind of lays down the law and he's like, you know, um, you know, the only reason I'm not putting you off the ship, not for yelling at these people, because um, did you not notice that one of the guys has probably, you know, first or second degree burns on his hands and you're the first thing you thought was to yell at him. And, he ends up leaving her. Oh, this is when something else is going on. He ends up leaving her at attention in his office for probably 10 or 15 minutes, you yeah. know, honestly. And then when he comes back, she's let it kind of sink in. Yeah. You know what? That was not the way I should have handled this. Cause he calls her out saying you, you did that for an hour. Yeah. You we're yelling yeah. at them for an hour. Yeah. And then he leaves, he deals with the, the, um, refitting i think he was going to meet with somebody for refitting something yeah was it the table or something the table yeah yeah and then he comes back in and yeah he and she she finally realizes like oh yeah i know i fucked up yeah and it's her first real honest answer to her to him because she he asks her like can you do this job for me like i need you to be my right hand i need you to if i need you to clench you're gonna clench if you're gonna hold i need you to hold can you do that for me? And she said, I don't know. And that was the first time she was honest with him. And then, but I'd like to try. So yeah. you start seeing her turn at that point too. And so the refitting is when he gets in there, there are two, there are two separate uh, tables. Um, and one of the guys betting something or another, I can't remember who it was. Or maybe it was a part of the initial that bet. That was a was, part of the initial bet. That's what Bill. it was. He wants oh, to sit yeah. at the captain's table. And yes. And Ishmael was like, no, no bet. You're going to have it. You're going to be sitting with me anyway. Yeah. Which confused the hell out of him. Yeah, he doesn't know that. So, yes. So, he ends up having them come in, taking out both tables, and uh, installing a new one. One of the things I really like about that is when he comes on, he calls up, you know, he calls up Gretchen. She talks it over. And he's like, so what's the deal? He's like, you know, he's like, well, here's the problem. I can either do it the way you told me to do it, or I can do it the way it should be done. And he's like, you know what? You're absolutely right. I that my mistake. Yeah. I should have I should have asked the people involved before, you know, whatever. And I love seeing that in leadership because I don't always see that. Okay. Um I have a boss that thinks that way, thank God. Like he goes and, and talks to the individuals that needs to be talked to before decisions are made. I can't say that necessarily for the people above him, but anyway, uh, so I love seeing when stuff like that happens. So anyway, yeah, they're like, yeah, we can take care of this. So they go out, they change it out. And now it's one big table. So everyone's going to sit together and, uh, it surprises everyone. But when, uh, Gretchen comes back in, she kind of blows her top over it and he's trying to figure out why are you not Gretchen? Not Thomas. Gretchen. No, I'm sorry, Thomas. When Thomas comes back in, she kind of blows her top and he's like, why are you freaking out about this? And then it hits him. He's like, I've been inconsiderate. I've been con well. He's actually inconsiderate of her twice well, right in say, a row. One because he realizes you haven't eaten breakfast yet, have you? And yeah. you're probably freaking starving. So go, go off the ship, get some food. Yeah. Get some food. 
I will pay for it. Go take care of that. And then when she comes back, she sees the thing. She kind of loses her top, and he thinks about it and is like, oh, you're really short, and you're it's going to look kind of weird with you just kind of dangling your legs like a little kid. And so he goes to Gretchen. He's like, hey, can you fix this? She's like, yep, got it. Once again, whatever you ask her, she's got it down. She knows her shit. And Gretchen walks in when it's all changed up, and she's like, oh, this is actually the original configuration for this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. So um, we get on – I think we have at least part of the voyage at this point. Things things are starting to gel. Things are starting to to kind of work. Um, and they go to pick this they, – they pick this large cargo. They're on their way out. They see this large cargo. It would be a crap ton of money, but they're like, oh, we're still too far out. It's – I don't, we don't th- I don't think we can make it, you know, so on and so forth. Um, oh, before we get to that. So here's another funny thing that comes up. I think he's it's t- he's talking to Mr. Paul about this. He's like, "Well, how long how long is the trip?" He's like, "Oh, it's going to be uh, two weeks." Weeks. <laughs> and he's like, "Okay." So he's like, "That doesn't sound right." So he does his own configuration. He goes, "That's No, like we can shave days off of this." He's like, "Where are you getting this information?" He goes, "Because it's what's in the ship." And he gets to looking, and he's just like, okay, rip out all that information, do your own calculations, and sure enough, he comes up with a, a, a time that's sure. even faster than Ishmael's. Yeah. And he's just like, well, why is this happening? And he's like, well, this is the standard that's built into the ship. And he's like, but this doesn't make sense. This is not our ship. Like, the weight changes every single time, and our destination changes. Why are you still using this thing? And they get to looking – and it turns out it was input in the system by David Birdside because of the previous captain, what's his face from the Dickhead William Tinker. Yeah. So yeah. he's like, well, I'm sure he did this because the captain's like, nope, every trip should take the exact same amount of time because he wants everything to be nice and normal. And he's like, throw that out. We're doing our own thing. Yeah. And it turns out Billy the Buccaneer is actually a pretty damn good astrogator. Um so they get to looking. They're like, can we do this? Can we do this? They get in close enough. They ask Gretchen, hey, can the ship handle it? She's like, yep, I think we can do this. So they pick this large cargo. Um, they get in. They basically just kind of you know, have a very short on uh, onshore where the three troublemakers get to test out the whole um, co-op. co-op thing. He explains that whole thing to them. I also love that conversation where he's uh, – He's telling him, he's like, yeah, he said, I made, you know, enough money in the first, what, year or so that I was on the, on my original ship to pay for my first couple of years of, of, at the academy. And there's just like, there's no way you did that co-op. He goes, no, I did that. You're right. You're right. I'm lying. And they're like, of course you're lying. He's like, I did it when I was picking cargo for the ship. And they're just like, you were picking cargo for the <laughs> ship that you owned for the ship that you were on as, as a low tier person. He's like, yeah. That's not a thing. <laughs> we tripped up from the yes. Yeah. So I also love the whole conversation. I love the fact that these the three guys also kind of get on board pretty easily once they realize that he's not there to goof off. He's there. To, he's honestly there to make money. And so well, like when he's like, "Listen, you know, I'm not going to bust your asses. I know y'all are smuggling stuff. Um, obviously, this isn't working out well for you. You know, this is the way you should be doing it." And they're just like. Nope, you're right, Captain. We're not going to fight you on this. He's just like, listen, just just don't screw me. <laughs> so, well, it, it's it's his leadership style is a great way of showing in order to gain respect, you have to give respect first, right? And and it, it's it's something that you really I, the, I enjoy watching in that. So, no, I absolutely do too. Um, and so they pick this large cargo, they um. They overjump and it doesn't look like they're going to make it. So they're trying to figure out, well, is there anything we can do? And they're like, well, there's, they're all thinking outside the box at this point. And they're like, well, there's a small asteroid. We could literally like, just like shave right by the damn thing. We're going to be in the red going the entire time, but we could probably make it picking it up, you know, picking up enough speed. And kind of at the last minute, he goes to talk to Gerhardt and he's like, am I an idiot for doing this? And she goes, yeah, I think we all kind of are. Maybe we, I kind of got caught up and was excited. So yeah, maybe maybe let's not get splattered on this this asteroid on on the way out. And he's like, okay. So he tells everyone in the ship, he's like, listen, you know, I'm sorry, we did our best. We're not gonna make money on this. You know, we're gonna get damn close because they do. They they go the safer route, 
yeah. and they pick up some more headwind, and it's going to get really close. Like they're going to be with hours of possibly, you know, coming through and making this huge amount of money. Um, and then they get a distress call from another ship. And it's like, you know, um, our filters are out. We're literally, we've literally got like seven hours of oxygen left. And then things are going to get real, real bad over here real quick. Um, and so it's not even a question. He's like, nope, we're going to go rescue him. And because he has thoughts of um, the, the other ship that they ran into. Uh, so they go pick him up. And I love the whole conversation of uh, <laughs> Billy's like, are you sure they're not pirates and they're not going to come over and steal our stuff? And he's just like, <clears throat> you know, I don't think it's ever happened, but he starts looking around. He's like, is there any reason it couldn't happen? And everyone's like, well, I guess technically not, Captain. I mean, I guess we could, you know, get well, Shanghai, but... It, uh, it's interesting, too, because uh, this is the first glimpse that you get of another uh, society that we don't really talk about in this series. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Odin's Outpost. And, mm-hmm. and he's like, "What? what's over there? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's Odin's Outpost. Well, it's not on anywhere. Like... Everything's legal around here. Why? Why is it there? It's there. It's there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, what is? What does Billy call it? Um, oh. Uh, it, it, the pirates. Tartuga. Yeah. Tar- yeah. High Tartuga. Yeah. High Tartuga. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's funny because he just throws it out there like he's like, oh yeah, I know what that is. It's High Tartuga. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so they find another. They come across this other ship. They're like, absolutely, we're gonna help them out. Um, they dock with them. They, you know, pull some of the people over. It's very obvious they're not pirates. Like it's a bunch of it's a bunch of tourists. tourists yeah. yeah. Um, and he gets to talking with the captain, who is married to the first mate. I'm t- sorry, who is married to yeah. the uh, engineer. Uh, engineer. Yeah. Um, which he's just kind of like, well, that's that's an interesting thing, but okay. Um, and she's just like, yeah, we, um, you know, we picked up some used filters. I guess I should have checked into them better. Uh, but it turns out, you know, we had some tourists, they wanted to all come home together, you know, they picked up some friends, uh, and we just got in a bind and too many people on board, too many people on board. They and said, she said it, we got greedy. Yeah. Um, and so they're obviously not going to make their, they're not going to make it on, on, you know, on the way home, but they end up, um, holding off the, they help the people out long enough for. Uh, some filters to arrive. She's like, you know, I did order some more filters. They're on an express packet out here. He's like, well, when they've gotten here, she's like, day after tomorrow. Like, they would not have been there anywhere near enough time. Uh, so had they not picked them up, everyone on that ship would have died. Um, but they get them set back up. Ship goes in. They pull in. They're really late. So basically, they're not going to make any money on this trip. Um, and he's, you know, kind of really, you know, off-put about that. Um and so he's just like, well, I'll, I'll stay with the ship or whatever. And, uh, you know, it, it's fine. It is what it is. Um, I, is this the night that the rest of the crew go off and get in trouble? Or is that later on? I don't remember. I think that's later on. I think okay. that's later on. Yeah, this is, I think, doesn't he do takeout for everybody to kind of boost their spirits a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And then him and Greta go out for supper with the captain and engineer that's from... Right. The other ship. That's right. Um, okay, so yeah. I do have this in order. Crew does get in, and in, in, it may be the next port, but the crew goes out and, and gets in a fight. Um, and I love that scene. <laughs> I love that scene when they come back. Because uh, at this point, they've kind of gelled together. Um, it wasn't until after that that we find out that Jen was cheating. Like, it was that far into the book. Oh, yeah, it was near the yeah. end of the book. So, yeah, uh, even though we talked about that, you know, at the beginning. But anyway, so... Um, um that's what it is so i think it was the first night they're there um the, the second night rolls around and uh yeah they go have dinner him and the him and gerhard go have dinner with the captain and the engineer and the next morning there's a uh there's a package that's been sent from the owner of this other company that's got a bunch of entertainment cubes so that they've got stuff to watch uh and has literally paid for all of the fees and everything that they were they lost out on by you know they basically covered their ass and he's like listen yeah this was a lot of money but this was nothing compared to what you did for us like we mm-hmm. would have been in so much shit had you had you not done what you did that so was plunkets junkets yeah uh, <laughs> that's 
<laughs> everyone's everyone's in a good mood. Everyone goes out for the night, has a good night. Uh, he stays with the ship, and he's sitting there playing um, um, cribbage, cribbage yep. with uh, with uh, with uh, Mr. Schubert. Phil, I believe. Schubert, that's right. He plays and uh, starts getting later. Starts getting later. It's like, well, no one's no one's shown back up. Wonder where everyone is. And uh, then the authorities show up with the rest, with pretty much his entire crew. It's like him, because the 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 uh, the engineer she comes back early, but the rest of the crew show up and they're all like missing shoes. They've got black eyes. There's blood on them. Uh, you know, they just look like shit. And he's just like, okay, um, I thought we were over this, but whatever. And they start kind of you know he's just going down the line what happened and he starts with the troublemakers and they're like well we tried our best captain but we if we had a couple more minutes we could have gotten out of there we could have pulled everyone out and he's like what do you mean pulled everyone out so he goes to the next person he's like well we got in there and we started having fun and everything else and some of these other ships started talking shit and you know most of the time we just kind of roll with it but you know we're like you know hey things are getting better blah 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 and he keeps going down the line (laughs) and it's like well what happened and it ends up getting down to Thomas. Uh, Thomas, and she's just like, they called you a chicken. And he's trying not to laugh. But that's literally what, and she's, it's not even the troublemakers. It was her that started it. And they're just like, yeah, if we had a few more minutes, we could have pulled her off of like, because at one yeah. point he's like, no one else jumped in. They're like, you didn't really need backup, to be honest with you. Like, she was handling her own. <laughs> we were just trying to get her the hell out of here before the authorities showed up, but they showed up too early and we, we got caught. Um, and so anyway, I mean, what do you do? Like you're, you're at this point, your crew has come to get, Oh, we missed something important before this. The crews come together. Part of this is also because he hasn't, you know, another little thing pop off in his head and he's just like, Hey, I need you to, to Thomas, I need you to go get your hearing checked real quick before we go, before we get underway. And when she comes back on the ship, she literally is talking at a normal voice and everyone's just like, what the hell is going on? And she's like, apparently I have hearing loss. And yeah. I was talking super loud and my apologies for that. And everyone at that point, everyone's like, all right, well, cool. Maybe, maybe that was part of the problem. And it turns out it was. So, yeah. um, but anyway, so the crew started to gel. We had this big fight or whatever. Um, it's at this point that, you know, he finds out that his wife's been cheating. Um, Mr. Paul also gets uh, beat up in port. <laughs> And uh, they have to figure out how they're going to get him back on ship, back on the ship or whatever. And you know they're like, we're we're going to you know try to wait for him, Captain. And he's like, yes, we're <laughs> no, we're not leaving. We're not leaving a member unless we absolutely have to. We're not leaving anyone behind. So they end up getting him back on ship. Oh, that's and, uh, yeah, right near the end of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so uh, uh, at, it's at this point they're getting close. They're almost done to the end of the bet. Um. Mm-hmm. He already knows, you know, he, 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 he doesn't really know which way it's going to come out. He's, he's gotten everything done. He wants to get done. So he's already put in to have a hot tub, even if, even before the, the, the bet settled. And everyone's just like, you knew for a fact, you know, Mr. Hill was going to win. He's like, no, I just thought we needed a hot tub anyway. So hot, sounds like a great idea to me. Yeah. Sounds like a good idea to me. Um, he's like, but with all the money that we've made just on this last trip, he's like more than pay for it. So. Uh, so you get the hot tub, uh, the bet finalizes and it ends up coming out. Mr. Hill wins by one. Correct? one yeah. yeah. And he's like, that was, that was really good. They're like, what are you talking about? Like you made 10,000 more dollars than we did with, with your picks. He's like, well, you know, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. So, um, he also got to pick first. Very yeah. true. So, um, so Mr. Ricks ends up deciding to leave. Uh, near the end of the book, Mr. Ricks decides he's going to leave. He's going to move on. He's uh, several people have sat for uh, um, higher, you know, higher pay grades or whatever, and gotten it, uh, which is also something I really like for this character that he's always pushing people to, you know, try to improve themselves. Um, but anyway, one of his guys decides, yeah, he's going to leave. He's going to go to this other ship, and he's like, he's like, well, great, fantastic. I need to go find someone else to replace you, but no, I'm not going to hold you back or whatever. And he goes to have lunch with Maloney again. And so far up to this point, Maloney's kind of, uh, you know, he's not really a bad guy, but he also has done some shit. I'm just like, ah, oh, it's kind of shady. Kind of an asshole move on you to yeah. do this. He, he's the guy that hired him to, as a third mate to put him on the shittiest friggin' mm-hmm. 
uh, boat that he's got in order to turn it around. It's like, that's a really shitty thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> but it also shows that he kind of, he, he has to believe in him to, to be able to do some of the stuff that he can do. But yeah. Um, but he asked him, he's like, well, do you want me to, do you want me to scut this? Do you want me to, you know, I'll put in a word and they will turn him down and you won't lose him. He's like, no, why would I want to do that? Like, I want people to move up. Um, I have worked in positions where this has happened to me and believe me, it, that sucks. Like to find out the reason why I didn't get moved over to a different position is because, well, we really like you in the position you're in. It's just like, it, you're, that's more money and better hours. Why are you doing this to me? Like, screw yeah. you. <laughs> I'll stop doing my job as well. How about that? <laughs> um, and so it's at this point, he's like, okay, well, you know what? Fine. If you want to let this go through, I'll let this go through. But if you do this, I'm giving you the worst person we've got. Of course, at this mm-hmm. point, Ishmael kind of already, you know, he's like, well, fuck this. I can, I can do whatever I want. So give it to me. What, what else you got for me? You've, everything you've <laughs> thrown at me, I've taken care of. What else you got for me? So he goes to find uh, his new person, and it's um, Stacy Arioni. Arioni. Uh, he's like, well, where can I find her? Well, she's in the brig right now uh, for being in a knife fight. <laughs> and he's just like, okay, didn't see that coming, but sure, why not? <laughs> so he goes down and meets her, and he's just very Ishmael with her. He's just like, hey, um, I'm the captain of a ship. Um, you know, uh, they're telling me I have to take you. If you want to be, you know, come aboard, you're more than welcome to. And she's just like, you know, well, what ship, ship are you? What shitty yeah. ship are you on? The Agamemnon? He's like, yes, actually, I am the captain of the Agamemnon. <laughs> and she's just like, well, do I really want to do this? Like, <laughs> is it that bad? And But he wins her over just with the way he's talking. He's just like, he's like, well, I don't he, care what you've done. I'm here to make money. And as long yeah. as you're on the ship to make money, we can work together. He He's honest with her in the way of like, this is how much we made the last in, in the last run. Yeah, I don't expect you to believe me. I have no reason to lie to you. So... This is the offer. Do you want to join us or not? And, that, and, and we have a hot tub. And we have a hot tub. <laughs> yes, that whole scene of getting her onboarded is fantastic. The whole... Yes, with all the knives and the yes. weapons. That's probably one of my favorite parts of that book, too. Yeah. And, a lot, uh, you know, was it Hill that was all upset with him? Yes. Yeah, are you serious? Like, yeah. you're, you're going to let her on with all these knives? She's she's going to... She's, she's armed. It's like, yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> And what and what is she gonna do? She, she's gonna while we're out in the middle of nowhere yeah. in space, she's gonna kill someone. And then what is she gonna do? Yeah. Walk home? <laughs> like it it doesn't make sense, guys. Think this through. Uh, because once again, one of his initial talents in this book as a character is he's able to see things in people that even if he doesn't see it right up front, he just knows there's something else there. Because she becomes a huge character throughout the rest of. Oh yeah, the, yeah. The she's there all through the rest. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and that is pretty much uh, Captain Share, uh, which you know will lead into the third and final book of this trilogy, which is Owner Share, which is our November pick, even though we're technically recording this in November. Whatever. <laughs> uh, time is weird. So yeah. anyway, um, final thoughts. I know you've already said, Ray, you think this is – well, I think all all three of us agree this is probably our second favorite of, of the series. Of the first six books, this is probably – yeah, this is my second favorite. Um I really enjoyed seeing Ishmael in this uh, and and take the leadership role. I he's he's everything that I want to have in a boss. Yes. Um, but you still see that he has growth to go. Like there's still still aspects of him that need to grow and and he needs to allow himself to to enjoy life a little bit more. So it, it's uh, yeah. It was, I enjoyed the book. That's... Yeah, at this point, life for him is just the ship. The personal life is smoldering ruin right, yeah. of his own doing yeah. yes. right now. But his professional career is perfectly on track. Mm-hmm. I like in this book that now that he's captain, he's got free reign to do anything. There's no asking permission anymore. Yeah. Which was in all the other books, like oh, yeah. I can do a little here, a little there, but I like, need to ask permission. This is like, now I'm captain. I'll do whatever I damn well please. And it's like Midas touch. Everything he touches just turns to gold. Yeah. But um, what got me in this book though is they never really address the fact that um, 
Delman, the previous captain, never picked up on any of this shit. Like, even the cargoes, like, can't understand why the cargoes are so low. Why didn't you even, like, look? Or the, the trips always take the exact same amount of time. Mm-hmm. See, well, but, being a captain, you should have known, like, you should have had basic astrogation skills. You should have known that that's not but, how this works. <laughs> and it, but they touch on that, and that shows you how shitty of a captain he really oh, is. Oh, yeah. And, and they do touch on a little bit when Ishmael meets up with him again uh, at one point. And, and he's like, no, things are going all right. And, but, and he's like, yeah, the William Tinker is going to take care of Delman. Yeah. Yeah. Because he left him with a good crew, and they'll they'll set him straight. Straight. Yeah. But the fact that he was captain, and like for the Agamemnon, like he was captain for so many years on the Agamemnon, it got like the worst rap. Yeah. And like some of the basic stuff is like seriously. <laughs> but but I, and that doesn't really get addressed. Like if I were Maloney, I'd be like, I would have looked to fire him. <laughs> I I know people that are leaders like Delman. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem is <laughs> exactly it's like they're doing their job. That's it. There's well, that's no just it, but advancement or the whole point or... is to make money. That's all the company is supposed to be right. doing. So the company the... should have like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would I would that would be the one thing that they should have definitely looked in on. So Yeah, there's also... a lot, but yeah. It also says something about Maloney. I mean, we've already talked about the fact that he gave Ishmael two shitty positions and literally threatened him with a, a new person, but he's mm-hmm. certainly happy with his performance, but yeah. Yeah, but he's, he's not a good leader either because he he's ready to axe a fucking guy just to... Uh, yeah. Just, oh, you're good in your job? You stay there. Yeah. yeah. It's like, no, fuck you. I want to move on. So... <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some problems with that. So... Which, you know, an, other things come up in the next book. You know, a lot of the stuff that's happened in this book, especially with management and, and company and stuff, are rectified. But <laughs> it's the other stuff that happens that we get to that's interesting. So, um, Well, like I said, next month we will be reading – our next episode we will be reading um, – um, Owner's Share. Owner's Share, which is the last of this part of the trilogy. Um, originally we talked about ha- taking a break over December. Just because it's Christmas time, usually there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, our friend Jen has talked about possibly maybe what if we did an episode where we talk where we just um, I think she talked about things that just talk about catch up on things that we've been reading, maybe not things that we've covered. Uh, so it's not like you'd have to prep or anything. So who knows? We may end up just kind of doing a fun episode in December where we just sit around and discuss some of maybe our favorite books from, that we've read over the year or whatever. So Chris would join for that one, I think. Yeah. So. Um, well, let's go on to what else we've been reading. Uh, Ray, have you been reading anything else? or? Uh, yeah. Um, I got a new uh, comic book. It was, uh, I can't remember the name of it off right now. It's um, basically, um, oh, it's War, War of the Realms. It's a uh, Thor and uh, some of the Avengers kind of get together and fight. Um uh, anyway, I just got it started, and then another one that I picked up, I haven't started just yet, but uh, is it's kind of like a what if, where um, what if Spider Man embraces the symbiote and becomes evil and goes down that territory? So that'd be cool. Yeah, I'm interested in that one for sure. Um, I am in the middle of trying to get back into, so after reading this one, I'm trying to get back into Mavericks, uh, the book two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm having a hard time with book two for the Mavericks. It's just, there's nothing happening right now. And it's been so long since I read them. I can't remember. I'm, I'm which. almost tempted to say, fuck it and go back to, <laughs> go back to Joe, but <laughs> I'm going to push through and get through it. I think I'm almost at the point. It's just, yeah, you know, like I said, they're, they're setting up what's mm-hmm. going to happen, but nothing is happening right now. So, is that when they go to Squid World? They're going to go. They're still... Oh, okay. Going. The action does pick up when they finally land on Squid World. Yeah. Well, they're going after... So they split up. Perkins is one way, and yep. then the crew's off to get the item, and then you're going to be yeah. back. And it's like, fuck, just go already. God. 
I mean, that's so long ago. So many books ago. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sean, what else have you been reading? Um, I'm just finishing up Final Days. It's book one in a series by uh, Jasper Scott and uh, Nathan Highstead or something. It's read by Ray Porter, which oh, okay. is kind of one of the things that got me. But it's basically, so it's the first book in a series basically like every natural disaster on the face of the earth that could happen is going to be happening Mm -hmm. in like 10 days time. And, um, there, uh, it focuses around an FBI agent looking for missing people. A bunch of people went missing and they're, she's like trying to find them during this end of days time. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, uh, an ex Marine, his daughter is one of the ones that goes missing and he's looking for her and that their paths eventually merge and um turns out all the the disasters were triggered by a man i think like the super volcano and yellowstone tsunamis basically wiping the planet clean to start fresh is what it is so the first book takes place in like those 10 days it, it it's not it's not a complicated book it's uh, one of those like i'm a spine sitting in a thing of popcorn just kind of oh kind of gotcha. thing going on there's everything is pretty cliche in it okay. but it's ray porter reading it so it's fun nice it wasn't a long book i i might do the rest mm-hmm. in the series play it by ear but yeah i got like 10 minutes left in that one and then i'm gonna reread the bob verse nice. so i'm looking forward to that one um i had to go back actually real quick to look and see what i have been reading uh it is halloween time or we just finished up halloween time so i usually listen go back and listen to some of my more horror based books um the uh the two that i the two new ones that i read is uh, i downloaded the exorcist and read it <laughs> um we'll listen to it um once again because it you know of, of the movie there's a lot of stuff that's cut out there uh but um yeah there's only been a couple of times that i've listened to a book that kind of creeps me out and mm-hmm. even though that movie is creepy as all hell <laughs> it was just okay like you know i, I don't know if it's just because i kind of had a general idea of what was going to happen or whatever but uh book form just didn't really freak me out uh, the other thing that I read was um, another book that I had not read by Stephen King, Everything's Eventual, and this is a collection of short stories. Uh, some of them are just okay. Some of them are actually really good. In fact, there's a couple in there, at least one of them, is a prequel story for the um, uh, Dark Tower series that I've known of its existence and just kind of fell off my radar a long time ago. And so whenever I start hearing about the uh, the Little Sisters, I'm just like, Oh, oh, we're we're going back to the Dark Tower. This is okay. This is gonna be good. Um, and so I got you know a little bit more piece of of that story or whatever. But there's several there's several stories in it that uh, that were uh, that were fun fun listens to. Some of them are a little more a little more silly. Some of them are a little more you know dark or whatever. So uh, and then just listen to you know a, a smattering of other you know horror or, or, or you know more Halloween type stories. So like I said, I always tend to do that you know about this time of year. Just Go through my old thing. Like I've got like three hours left of listening to Pet Cemetery again. So um, I could not listen to that book the last time I tried doing it. Listen to it this time, and I'm I'm okay with it again. So it just <laughs> you know I've thought about it. L- listening to it, I thought about it. Uh, I know we did an episode of the Epic the Geeky Show where we talk about um, things that hit differently now that we've gone through you know a pandemic. Um, I thought about it'd be a little might be kind of close to the same topic, but talking about things that hit differently, you know, as an adult, as in a kid, because that's one of those things like when you're a kid or you know in your teenage years, it's like, okay, your little boy came back, like he's he's a little boy, like go push him down a flight of stairs and take care of it. It's not like you're fighting a a, a vampire or, or a werewolf or something like that. And you know, the horror is the fact that it's your little boy that came back. So, you know, it hits differently when you're an adult. Um 
but yeah, so that's that's what I've been listening to. So, um, well, that is our show for the month, ladies and gentlemen. If you would please give us a five star rating on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, wherever you listen to the show, you can also find us at on YouTube where there's the video version. Not really much to look at, but <laughs> we're here. Ow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a bunch of talking heads. How, how about I put it that way? Um, you Bold. can find us at. Uh, <laughs> Bald and bearded talking head. Yeah, very true. Uh, hey, we got we got that covered. Still have hair up there. There you go. Um, we uh, you can find us at epicallygeeky.com, where you can find all the shows that we do, including uh, marginally geeky, creatively geeky, sustainably geeky, and of course the original epically geeky. Uh, you can find us on all the social media at epically geeky as well. Where can we find you online, Ray? The Reluctant Yeti on Instagram. Sean, screwing with Wikipedia, and your favorite broken toy on Instagram. And it's spelled the Canadian way. Yes. <laughs> and as always, you can find my individual wacky adventure online at Optimus Chain on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For everyone on the site, have a good night. Bye.